Today we're going to be taking a look at the cooperative game, The Crew, Quest for Planet Nine. Before we do get started, we want to send a big shout out and a thank you to local Windsor gamer, Kevin, who was awesome enough to gift us with a copy of this game. Yeah, thanks so much, Kevin. So The Crew, Quest for Planet Nine, was designed by Thomas Singh and features rather evocative artwork from Marco Armbruster. Bruster. Here in North America, it was published by Cosmos in 2019. This is a cooperative trick-taking card game for two to five players, where each round of the game takes anywhere from five minutes to half an hour, depending on the scenario you're playing and how quickly you win or fail. I will say most rounds do tend to fall on the shorter side of this scale. Now, the crew has won a number of awards and accolades um, and even more nominations. This includes the Spellimpre Best Advanced Game, the Guildbricken Best Adult Game, the Dutcher Spiel Priest Best Family Slash Adult Game, the Meeple's Choice Award, the Golden Geek Best Cooperative Game, and most prestigiously, most well-known, the 2020 Kenner Spiel de Jar, the biggest award in board gaming. Now, there are a number of components that come with this card game beside cards, and for a good look at those, you should check out our The Crew unboxing video over on YouTube. So in addition to a main deck of cards, which is split over four suits with cards numbered one to nine and four rocket cards numbered one to four, you also get this smaller deck of hobbit-sized cards that match the original deck, excluding the rockets. There is a number of tokens, including pass tokens, communication tokens, a commander standy, and a distress signal token. Overall, the component quality is excellent, uh, especially for the cards themselves, which have a very playing card like feel and texture to them and they feature some great panoramic artwork where if you put the number one to nine you get this really cool space picture and some really easy to distinguish symbology which will help anyone with color blindness issues so what are we doing with these cards and tokens how do you play the crew all right so for being what's really an abstract strategy game the crew features a significant amount of background and story so in this game, you are playing a, a, a crew, a set of astronauts about to leave Earth on a quest to find Planet Nine, which I'm assuming is Pluto. Isn't that the ninth planet? Or maybe they're trying to find something else, but whatever. Now you're going to do this by playing through 50 unique scenarios in turn, starting from number one, going up to number 50, each of which progresses the story and increases the difficulty and complexity of the game. Now, the scenarios start off as training missions uh, while you're still supposedly on the ground and are very simple and do a great job of teaching you how to play the crew. So to be fair, there is no real need to know anything about the story or background. Having played it on Board Game Arena, I'm actually unaware of the, the story portion, and I still love the game. Fair enough. Now, to start a game with the crew, you're going to pick one of the missions to play. Now, I admit, like I just said, you're usually going to start at one and go up to 50, but honestly, the game can be played by randomly picking one, playing your favorite you played before or whatever. Now, each of these missions is going to set a goal for the game, which always involves some type of rule for who you want at the table to take specific tricks. Now, usually, this involves one or more players having to take a trick featuring a specific numbered card in a specific suit, like Sean must take the three in yellow. Sometimes more than one player needs to take a specific trick. And then other times they'll need to get these in a specific order. Now there are also missions where specific players take a set number of tricks or they have to take a trick including a one or it's uh, whatever. It, there, there's tons of comments, 50 of these, right? The game is really all about the right player winning the right trick at the right time. Right. And you're picking in order the tasks that you're going to do each mission. So yeah. if there are six tasks that need to be done, you pick one and then you go around the table when everyone's oh. picking, but you, you do get a choice. Yes. Now these tasks are determined by the, the smaller Hobbit cards I mentioned. You're going to shuffle that, you're going to flip it up, and then you're going to look at the mission to see what you do with it. So you got the deck of missions that are going to come up. Now there's 36 cards in the smaller deck. What's missing are the rocket cards, which I'll explain why those matter in a bit. Uh, so mission one, it's one player has to take one trick with, uh, with a task card, really simple. Well, there's 36 different versions of that mission, right? Cause there's 36 different cards. You might be going for the one yellow or the four blue or the seven green. 
when you get to mission two, you're now trying to get two cards. Now you're up to 1,260 possible combinations. of, and, and both those numbers don't account for the fact that who the captain is each round changes and who will want the cards. Like, yes, the fact I want it one round, maybe next time Sean's the one that's going to one that wants the trade. Like there is a huge amount of replayability in just a single mission in this game. Yeah. And then are you adding the, what hands you get, what cards you get dealt into your hand, yeah. which yet again, adds to the, uh, the, the changes and the difference in the, in the, the possibilities. Yeah. So, it, it really gets kind of crazy, the number of potential uh, re uh, replays. Like, I would honestly say infinitely replayable. Like, until you're sick of the game, <laughs> you're, you're, you're probably never going to play the same game twice with all of the variables in play, even just on that first mission, just with the number of variables. Now, with these Hobbit-sized task cards, there are a bunch of tokens. And these are to indicate things like, oh, this card has to be taken first, this one has to be taken second, or this card must be taken before this other card, or a bunch of the other things as indicated by the missions. So what you're going to do is you're going to put out the task cards, you're going to have the tokens there in the center of the table, you're going to deal out the full deck of the full cards, like the large cards, the, the suit cards. Now, no matter how many players, you always deal out the full deck. Then everyone's going to look at their hand and whoever has the number four rocket card becomes the commander. And they take a standee for that to show that they're the commander. And then the commander is going to look at the task on the table and pick one to complete. Um, one they think they're going to be able to do. Now note, you can't communicate a lot here. Like there, there is some limit to what you're allowed to communicate while drafting this. Then the player on their left is going to take a task and the player on their left is going to take a task until they're all gone. Note, because of this, depending on your player count and how many tasks there are to complete, some players may have more than one to do on a mission. Now, the actual tasks are completed when the player who has the task in front of them wins a trick containing the card or cards in front of them that match on their task cards. Now, the task card is then flipped over when this happens, and if players are able to flip over all their tasks, then the players complete the mission and win. Now, if at any point you can't win, uh, due to like someone taking the wrong trick or something getting taken before another thing, or the fact you know the nine's already gone or whatever, you lose the mission. Now, when you win, you're assumed you'll move on to the next mission, and if you fail, it's assumed you'll retry the same mission. So failing can happen the first time around if someone has made a mistake or isn't paying attention, or it can come right down to the wire mm. and no one is quite sure if you'll win that round or not right up until that very last card played. Yes, and this is also why I mentioned by the gameplay length is so variable because you could have seven missions where all the players, you get all that set up and then you play and then you screw something up the first round and the game's over. You're done. You've played your entire round of the crew in less than five minutes. Now, I, I we mentioned multiple times the trick-taking game. This is a standard trick-taking game. All standard trick-taking rules apply. The commander starts off with the lead. They choose any of their cards to play. Significant follow players must follow the lead and play a card from their hand of the same suit. If a player doesn't have any cards of the suit that was led, they can play an, any card known as playing your off card. If the trick is then won by the player who played the highest number of the card suit led. Now, each suit has one of each of cards numbered one to nine, and there are four suits. Now, in addition, there are the rockets I mentioned a couple times. These are only numbered one to four. These are trump cards. The trump never changes in this game. It's always rockets. A trump card will take any trick it's played on, regardless of what suit was initially led. And if more than one trump is played in a single trick, the highest trump card wins the entire hand. And we've talked plenty about many different trick-taking games here on the show, as they are a favorite of ours to play. Yeah, we, we're in the Midwest, so we play trick-taking games. We, we have a whole episode where we talk about the regionality of trick-taking games that you can catch on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Now, all of this, I admit, like, I, I played, so I know better. It sounds pretty simple, right? Uh, but that's where these communication rules come in. What makes the crew a challenge is that during the game, you can't talk about your cards at all. Like, you can't mention what suits you have, any number, if it looks good, if it looks bad. You're not even supposed to groan when someone takes something you thought you were going to win. You're not allowed to talk about numbers. There is no table talk allowed during a round of the crew. Sort of. What every player does have, though, is a way to communicate without talking. 
everyone has a communication token. And once per game, at the start of a trick, before any cards are played, no to trick, not a whole hand. It could be like your third trick in. You can use your communication token. To do this, you're going to take one of your cards, put it face up on the table, and you're going to put your token on it. And where you put your token communicates something to the other players. If it's at the top of the card, it says, this is my highest number in the suit. If it's in the middle of the card, it says, this is my only card of this suit. And if it's at the bottom of the card, it says, this is my lowest card of this suit. Now, you can only do this once per turn, and there's a little thing where you put this like blank card into your hand so you remember that your, your thing's there, but that's a little fiddly. So this is it. That's, that's the only way to communicate. Now, some missions may restrict this further, and missions can actually other, do other things, too, to mess with you, like uh, including who to get task tokens. Like There's at least one mission where the captain gives them out special rules for tricks just for that mission. Like Someone has to win a trick with a one, or passing and drawing cards. One of the missions I saw sounded fascinating. I haven't gotten to this one myself. That after your first trick, you then get a random card from the player on your left. I'm like, whoa, okay, that would mess everyone up. Yeah, so unlike most trick-taking games, where you can, to some degree, play on automatic, uh, this game requires a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. misunderstanding one task or getting the wrong or the order wrong or any number of tiny lapses in concentration can end around very swiftly oh there are so many times i played the crew um and played a card or clicked a card and went oh that why that, that, <laughs> yep. why did i do that yeah. <laughs> Now, there is a little bit of salvation. If your group is having a hard time with suspicious, uh, specifics, I can't say specific. Anytime your group's having a hard time with a specific mission, you also have the option at the very start of the round, once all cards are dealt, but before anyone has even discussed strategy or taken any task, to use what's called the distress signal. This is we're out in space and we send, we need help from Earth. When you do this, you flip the distress token over. Uh, you're going to go into your logbook right away and show that you used it because there is a penalty for using this. Then all players must pass one non-rocket card to an adjacent player. Now, the group as a whole decides if this is going to the left or the right, and all players are going to go the same direction, so everyone has the same amount of cards. While this seem while seemingly simple, this is a huge benefit mm -hmm. to the round. Yeah, because not only... Do you now know what one person to your left has? The person next to you knows what you have. Plus, it's a good way to for anyone who knows trick taking, void yourself of a suit, and which is always great in most of these games, unless you're playing one of the missions where you need to take all the tricks. <laughs> and there's always more to it. Now, while there's no like in-game penalty, during the round, you use the distress to no big deal. What it does is impact your overall mission score, which is something I haven't mentioned yet. There is a scoring system. At the end of each mission, you're meant to record in the provided mission logbook, or I would go online and get a PDF and print it out so you don't write in your game book, but that's your choice, how you did, how many attempts it took your group to complete the mission, and whether or not you used the distress signal. Now, once you've completed all 50 missions, you're meant to add up these scores, and then you get ranked on how good your crew is. So, having only played on Board Game Arena... I had no idea that there was any <laughs> scoring. I assumed it was just try and complete all, you know, successfully complete all 50. No, there, there is, a, there is a, a scoring system. And as I've mentioned in other co-op game reviews, I, I guess, I, I don't personally see the need for scoring. I guess it's a way to compare yourself with other groups. If I had multiple game groups, it would be interesting. Like if I played with like my Monday night group, and then I also played, say, at the CG Realm, a friendly local game store in Windsor, while we're checking out. You can, um, and then compared which group did better. So I guess I can kind of see it. I can see it more in this than some other uh, cooperative card games. Now, in addition to this, once you finish it, right, you've done all 50 missions. As I mentioned earlier, you can always go back and start over because, like I said, this game, I swear, infinite replayability. Like the odds of you getting the exact same hands the exact same time with the exact same task to the exact same people are so slim. You can go back and play any of it starting from the beginning or just go play your favorite missions. If you really like the one where the captain decides who's sick and then that player has to take no tricks, play that over and over again. In addition to this, there are a number of official and fan created missions that can be easily found online. Uh, one of the popular UK magazines actually has a whole set of like a, a second campaign in it. Now, in addition to these rules, 
there are special rules for playing with only two players. And technically, the five player actually does have a small variant with it, but it's basically the same. It's how it has to do with who gets to draft the tricks or the, the tasks. The two player, though, is a significant change. So the way this does this is the crew adds a third ghost player, um, which they an AI player, which they call Jarvis, which I, I don't know if that's a Marvel shout out, but it sounds like one to me. Maybe not. Maybe the Marvel shout out is probably a shout out to some space mission or something. I don't know. Not what I know. But anyway, you have an AI called Jarvis. And when setting up each round, you're going to deal Jarvis a hand. But this is done differently. Jarvis's hand, you have to shuffle all the cards, pull out the rockets. And you're going to put seven cards face down and then seven cards face up on top of them. Now, while playing through a mission, the commander controls Jarvis, who acts like any other player. Like, like the Jarvis is assigned pass, they take turns in clockwise order. It's just that the commander chooses which cards Jarvis plays. And then when you play a card, you're going to reveal the card underneath, right? So you get to see those seven hidden cards. So I, I know you're not a huge fan of, of variant rules for player counts, uh, but the, I mean, you just don't get a two-player game of this without it, this, right? No, as I mean, far as I could tell, like, I, I don't think you could, it, I don't know. I, I, we never tried. <laughs> it gave us the variant. We used the variant. It, it, it works well enough. Overall, uh, like the crew is just well done. Like, like it won a ton of awards, right? And, and it deserved every single one. This is an expertly designed and balanced game. It takes trick-taking, like really basic trick-taking. It's not even like weird trick-taking with six trumps or anything like that. This is like pretty much pure trick-taking with just adding the new element of certain people have to take certain tricks at certain times. That is really cool. And and so you have this, this like new way to do trick-taking that I found very engaging. Like Sean said, you engaging in the way that you have to pay attention. You are focused on this game while playing. And we have proven that if you're also chatting in Discord while playing, you tend to make mistakes. I think this is a great game for players familiar with trick-taking games in general. I also think, though, that it's very accessible to newcomers who may not know trick-taking due to the slow addition of rules in the mission system. The fact you only have to take one trick, like that's pretty simple to teach. Having to teach that for your one play like, like I, I almost want to use the first mission of the crew to teach someone to play a trick-taking game before, say, we go play Gorus Maximus, just to get that basic concept. I also dig the fact there's a story. Like, I can't think of really any other traditional card game that actually like, tells an ongoing story and an adventure and feels like a campaign. Like, sure, the, the Fox in the Forest has this fairy tale theme and a story about it, but you don't really feel like you're doing anything. It's just background. And I admit, it doesn't feel like I'm fixing a space station either, but like the story is baked into the mechanics. So for here's an example. In one mission, one of the crew members is tasked with doing repairs on your ship. So the main game mechanic to represent is that player can't use their communication token because they're busy. And I think that's really cool. Like, like to me, that's a, that's a pretty good integration of theme. It's not the best I've seen, but in a trick-taking game. Now in another mission, one of the crew members is sick. I mentioned this one earlier. Well, that member can't take any tricks because if they take any tricks, they infect the rest of the crew. And again, like that's that's a nice thematic tie-in to me. And and well, again, the story is notably missing in the online implementations. It's not really missed. It's still a solid trick-taking yeah. game with all these variants, uh, even if you don't understand the story behind them. Yeah, you definitely don't need the story, but I like the fact that it adds something. Yeah. And again, it ties together a lot better than you'd expect. Now, I do have to say, I Sean's only played the online version. I own a copy of the game and I've played it uh, a number of times. And it can be a bit fiddly, especially at the start of each round. Like, you got to deal out all the cards. You got to shuffle that. And then you got to go look up a mission in a paper book and find where you last left off. Then you got to look at it to figure out what the tasks are. So then you got to shuffle the task cards. You got to deal out more cards. And then you got to find the right tokens to put on those cards. And then everyone's got to sit back and got to discuss about who's going to take the task tokens. And you got to physically put them in front of you. Like, there's, it's just fiddly. There's a lot of stuff going on. That's a lot of setup for what honestly can be a round of a game that's over in one trip. Like, oh, someone screwed up. Then you got to do it again. It's not like you then put the same task tokens back to the middle and try again. No, you're supposed to, I guess you could, but you're supposed to wipe it. You're then going to re-grab all the cards. You're going to reshuffle the decks. You're going to reshuffle the tasks. You won't have to look it up in the book again, at least. You know that much, but it's just, it's fiddly. There's a lot of stuff you got to do. And two players, it's worse. 
because now there's Jarvis. And not only do you have to deal with Jarvis's hand, but you have to do it with a, a unique deck with no uh, rockets in it. So you deal out, you shuffle the cards with no rockets. You deal out Jarvis's hand. Now you reshuffle the cards with the rockets in, then you deal those to the players. And then you still got to do all the other stuff. You got to get your tasks and your tokens. And you got to decide who gets them. Like that's a lot of shuffling for what ends up being very quick especially at two players. Like the game's even quicker at two players. So even if you win, you're not looking at a long experience. And I found this really stuck out because my first gameplay experiences with the crew were online, playing on Board Game Arena. Now on Board Game Arena, the software does all of this, right? It does all the shuffling. It does the token placing. It tracks their communication tokens, everything. Now I admit, I love the feel of real cards in my hand. I like the feeling of shuffling and I prefer to play games face to face, but there are times I was playing the crew where I was like, man, I kind of want to go upstairs online and play. You know what? I could see this and, and, and I think they could really benefit from implementing this as a helper app. So you still have to shuffle your player cards, your one to nine and, and, and Trump and deal that out. But the task setup, the Hobbit cards mm. and task layout could be done on a, on a, on a, by an app on the table um, and take away a whole lot. All you need to do is tell it what mission you were doing and it could shuffle and, 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 yeah. and list some tasks out in front of you and, and really cut down the, the sort of, you know, pain of, of setting up each round. Uh, what I'd even prefer more is if everyone could have their app on their personal phone. And they put it out in front of them where their tasks would be. And yeah. just that way you can easily look at what everyone has. Yeah, I can totally see that. Now, going back to the two-player game. Well, it works. I, it, it works rather well. I got to say, it just wasn't as much fun as playing with more players. Uh, and then another thing Deanna notes that due to the lack of table talk, this is not a good date night game because you want to chat on date night. And you want to interact, and this is more just staring at your cards and playing them. So uh, I, I got to say, if, if I'm looking for a two-player trick-taking game, I'm not grabbing the crew. Sorry to say, Cosmos. Um, I would be going to grab something else like the Fox in the Forest or the Fox in the Forest duet. So so sorry for it, but eh, I, 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 this is one of those. I get that they put a two-player on, but I, I would say the crew is a three- to six-player game. Sometimes it's best to just let a game soar at what it was designed for and not try to wrestle it into other player counts, even though I realize that marketing PR often will People are gonna want push it. you to get more player counts on the box. If this came out without saying two to six on the box, there'd be people out there screaming, why can't I play a two-player? So I get it, but like I said, I'm, this isn't the one I'm going to choose with only two of us. Now, what really isn't evident when hearing about this game, and honestly, when first playing the first couple missions, is how dang hard it can be playing a trick-taking game where specific people need to take specific tricks. Like just saying that specific people have to take specific tricks. That sounds easy, right? So you're you're playing you're playing euchre and you're bidding on how many tricks your team's going to take. This should be easy to do. Oh, it is not. It is not at all. Uh, this game is way harder than you would think, especially with the communication restrictions. Um, and then added to that, there is the randomness factor, which is going to come up in any card game. But the randomness of the task deck can really adjust the difficulty of a given mission. Now I'm. I, I don't know. I'm almost certain that every possible combination is winnable during a game of the crew. I think managing this is certain cards is going to be definitely easier than others. Like, for example, if you need to take a one in a trick and you're the one holding that card and you have other numbers in that suit, that is hard to take that trick. On the opposite side, though, having a nine in a trick when you're holding the nine, oh, I need a nine yellow. I've got the nine yellow. Well, that's simple enough. You lead the nine yellow, <laughs> like done. I get that trick. As long as one of the other players doesn't have no yellows and plays a rocket, but I, they would probably realize what you're trying to do because they have you have in front of you a card that says you need the nine yellow. So, so like it really does affect it. And I gotta say, like it, it's it's a card game. Of course, there's randomness in the factor. So, it's it's definitely something that some players may not like this randomness. But in that case, they're probably not looking at trick taking games anyway. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm not sure that it's completely winnable. Uh, my gut feeling is that certain combinations of task and deal, uh, as well as who the mission leader position was, could result in unwinnable conditions. Uh, it's yeah. probably rare, but I, 
to to say that it's it's always winnable, I I have suspicions. See, I, I don't know. I'm thinking it's always winnable, but very unlikely unless you had open playing open information. Like if all the cards were face up, the the puzzle is always there to get it to play the cards in the right order. But the odds are your group doing that when they don't know what that order. I don't know. This, this might be worth googling once we're done the review because the game's been out long enough. Someone's probably right. on the math to figure out if it's always winnable. I I feels like it is. I hope. Like they, that's one of the things I don't like about some other cooperative games is that you can get on win- winnable situations where there's nothing your group can do to win. Right. I would hope that everything's winnable. It definitely, to me, feels like like I said, the odds may be slim, but so overall thoughts. Uh, the crew quest for Planet Nine is honestly one of the best tricking games I've ever played, and I am a long time fan of trick taking games like going back to hearts and spades and diamonds and euchre and i i have played i not all of them i'm sure but a a large number of trick taking games wizard five crowns um and then uh, other modern ones like uh goris maximus and macaron this game takes like like basic trick taking right like it, it's very pure trump never changes it, it takes the basics of of trick taking and does something new and cool with it in addition to this this is one of the best co-op games i own a uh, big part of that of course is the restrictions on communication like it pretty much eliminates any quarterbacking but yet despite the lack of communications you really need to work together to win this and being able to, to to play well, right, and 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 follow the right lead, and know that because this person led this, they probably mean this. Like that aspect of it, I really like, and I personally really appreciate the theme and story. I I think that's really neat. I like that it's actually tied to the mechanics in some of the missions. Now I gotta admit, the setup for each hand can be a bit fiddly, but I think the fiddliness is worth it. Every round I played of the crew is engaging and fun, even if we lose. I agree. Now, while I haven't had to deal with the fiddliness of the physical components, the online play I've taken part in has been fantastic every single time. Mm. Though, if you are playing online, you want to note, never play (laughs) turn-based. Real-time only. But that's really true for almost all trick-taking games. Yeah, if if you're playing turn-based, you better be taking lots of notes, because you're not going to remember who played what and what they played at what time and what they might have alluded to by that play. Yeah, it's just not that you, you play that one real time. I If you like trick-taking games, I'm sorry, go buy it. Get get the crew. Go online. Order it right now. Call your FLGS. Ask them to get you in a copy of, of Quest for Planet Nine. Like, seriously, this is a great trick-taking game. Now, if you like cooperative games, that's another good reason. Grab the crew. If you dig co-ops, it's a great co-op. Now, if you're not familiar with trick-taking games, I don't know. Because playing the crew would be kind of like diving into the deep end. But then the game kind of gives you floaties because you get the real slow progression and onboarding of the early missions. You might still want to check it out, but I do think this is definitely geared towards players who have trick-taking experience. Uh, If you're not a fan of trick-taking games, you know what? I might want to try this one. It does something very different. Like uh, this might be the thing that wins you over and go, oh, wait, there's more to trick-taking games than I thought. Now, again, I'm not going to say rush out and buy it, but maybe do a demo, see if your friend's got a copy, try it out. Uh, Same goes for people who don't like cooperative games because the crew does things differently and feels very different from your standard co-op games like, say, Pandemic or Forbidden Island. And again, I think it's worth giving a shot. Like Again, do a demo day. I'm pretty sure Cosmos has this. uh, You Go on Board Game Arena and try it. Yep. The crew's one of those games I'm really close to saying everyone should own this one. Everyone should just have a copy of the crew. But I know there's people out there that despise randomness in any card game or dice game or absolutely hate tricking game, trick-taking games, or refuse to play co-ops. Now, personally, I think those players may be missing out, but to each their own. Not every game is for everyone, and that's a beautiful thing. Well, we are done talking about the crew here. You can and should check out our The Crew review over at the blog at tabletopbellhop.com.